Hello everyone, I'm Janae Odani and I'm the Extension Veterinarian with the University of Hawaii at Manoa, College of Tropical Agriculture and Human Resources. In this video today, I will present an overview of the different types of internal parasites that affect sheep and goats. Gastrointestinal parasites are the number one health problem affecting sheep and goats. The climate in Hawaii is very permissive to most parasites. Uh, therefore, our animals tend to be at greater risk than animals that live in areas where, for example, there's a true winter. And in general, goats are more susceptible to parasites than sheep. And what makes all of this such a frustrating problem is that we are starting to see more and more resistance to dewormers. Host immunity plays a very important role in the actual clinical signs that you will see in an infected animal. While there are individual animal differences due to their specific genetics, there are also more generalized trends that can be predicted based on age and reproductive state. So what we have here is the relative age of the animal, some specifics about the production status, their plane of nutrition, and the you know relative immunity. Um, I, I didn't create this information. This can be found on a, a wonderful website, um, wormx.info, and um, you know, you'll find a lot of really good information from them about parasites in general. And okay, so if you have a relative immunity of one plus, that means that you are very, very, very susceptible to becoming ill with parasites. Whereas if you have lots of pluses, that means that your relative immunity can be predicted to be pretty strong. So let's kind of focus on um, who the extremes are. So I'm actually gonna start with you know these, these out here. Who are these animals that we can predict have pretty good relative immunity? So these are gonna be adult animals that are not lactating. And if they're well fed in a very high plane of nutrition, um, they're gonna be you know, doing pretty good. I'd expect them to be doing pretty good. Um, if they're underfed, you know, the access to only low quality forage, um, <clears throat> they're still gonna be pretty good just because they're adults and they're not lactating, but they're not gonna be doing as well as the ones who are well fed. And then, you know, at the other extreme, the, the ones who are the ones are going to be the babies that have, um, you know, early exposure to parasites who are underfed. And here, you know, we have, well, the animals, um, the younger ewes, the older ewes who are underfed with multiple um, babies on them. So this is um, just something to keep in mind, you know, when you're trying to figure out when you're doing the herd check, why do some die and some don't, um, you know, why do some animals just look like they're doing better, you know, even though maybe their numbers, um, their parasite numbers are terrible. These are the kinds of things that will play into that. So it, it does say sheep here. Um, this is from the Ferret Parasitology book. They, they just didn't have a separate slide for goats, but they kind of just meant small ruminants in general. And there's a lot of overlap between the two, of course, and they even do share some parasites with cattle. Um, okay, so the ones that we're mostly gonna be concerned with are the gastrointestinal parasites, the, the nematodes that they have. And Hamonchus, Ostertagia, and Trichostrongulus are the ones that live in the abomasum. Um, this is the, the rumen fluke. There are some other ones that will live in the small intestines um, that we are concerned with. So that would be the Trichostrongulus, the Cooperia. Uh, we do have some nematodirus here in Hawaii and you know some of these other ones as well. That's where the tapeworms will be located. And then in the large intestine, in the cecum and the colon, we we actually have a lot of esophagostomum here in Hawaii. Um, I don't recall ever seeing any Chabardia, but I have also seen some Trichuris. And so I, I do think that in Hawaii we probably have animals, you know, that are exposed to a, a wider range of parasites than maybe um, the ones in the mainland who seem to just be mostly uh, succumbing to the effects of homunculus. And, you know, of course, there are some other parasites here. Um, this slide gives you also the summary of the ectoparasites. We're not covering those today. Um, some of the other, um, you know, parasites that the animals have, but these are not really the ones that we're going to be talking about today. 
I have one slide here about the five point check for health that kind of gives us the health assessment of the animal um, that evaluates its clinical symptoms for parasitism. And there is another presentation that is uploaded to this channel that kind of goes into this five point um, health check more in depth. But here quickly, you know, there's five things that we look for. We look for the body condition, um, you know, Real quickly, it kind of looks like this, where body condition one, you're emaciated, all of your bony, point, bony points are sticking out all the way to the animal with a body condition score of five that is obese. Uh, we, we look for edema at the jawline. They refer to that as bottle jaw. Uh, we refer, or we, we look for external evidence of diarrhea or DAGs. Um, you guys have all heard about the FAMACHA scoring that we will do to evaluate for anemia. But again, I'll just caution you, the FAMACHA score will only give you an idea of what might be going on related to homunculus. Um, animals that are about to die from something like osteotasia or os esophagostoma, their FAMACHA scores are gonna be pretty good, um, but they, they are still gonna be severely ill. And the fifth thing that we'll look for is evidence of nasal discharge or, um, you know, a scruffy coat. We're going to start here with Hamonchus contortus, also known as the barbed pole worm, because it is the most serious of the gastrointestinal nematodes. It lives in the abomasum, the true stomach of the animal, and, you know, it's shown here, um, all of these little wiggly things are those Hamonchus worms, and they're called the barbed pole worm, you know, maybe I don't know, to me it looks more like maybe like a candy cane worm because it's got these white and uh, red stripes that kind of spiral around each other. And that represents um, the red blood that the animal has ingested from the animal or that the worm has ingested from the animal. And the white are all the eggs that it's about to, you know, release and spew out um, in the feces into the environment. And this pathogen is significant because it can cause profound anemia, protein loss that you know could manifest as bottle jaw or mandibular edema. Um, in adult animals, it can cause chronic weight loss um, or death. The next parasite that we'll talk about is Ostertagia circumcincta. It underwent a name change some years ago to Teledrosagia. Uh, but I don't think most people use this new term yet. It's also known as the brown stomach worm, and it also lives in the abomasum. Um, you don't see, you know, the red and white striped worms because that's not what they look like. They're a little bit smaller and brown. Um, but what's key here with this parasite is it has a, a larva that likes to embed into the tissue and they'll destroy the glands and they'll cause uh, nodules to form. And that's what we're seeing throughout here, the thickening of the abomasal folds with these little white gray nodules. This parasite can cause the animal to have diarrhea and they can have weight loss and some degree of anemia, though not as profound as with the homonchus. And this is what its egg looks like. And if you go back to the previous slide where I showed you what the egg from the homonchus looked like, you'll see that they're very, very similar in size and shape. Um, and this picture kind of shows you again, um, you know, same thing, the little worms live in the animal's abomasum. The little worms lay eggs. The eggs are passed in the poop. The eggs will develop into a larvated egg. The larva hatches, the larva crawls up the grass, and then the animal ingests it again. The next parasite is Trichostrongylus axii that is also referred to as the bankrupt worm or the small stomach worm. Um, this worm is physically shorter than the other two that we talked about. Um, again, this is what the egg looks like um, after it's passed in the feces. It's forming little balls, and those little balls are the cells as they're dividing, and eventually they're going to form into a larva that will again crawl up the grass to be eaten by another animal um, and completing the life cycle. This worm can cause diarrhea, uh, dehydration, bottle jaw, and emaciation. Trichostrongylus colubriformis is another parasite that sheep and goats can have. This one is called the hair worm or the black scour worm, and the adults live in the small intestine. Um, 
these parasites can cause diarrhea, they can cause bottle jaw and poor growth. So, you know, the symptoms are going to be pretty similar. Um, they're just located in a little bit different part of the body in the intestines versus in the abomasum. Cooperia is another uh, related parasite, and this one is referred to as the cattle bankrupt worm. Um, there's a little picture or a symbol of a sheep here, you know, just to remind the readers of this book that this parasite can also affect sheep and goats. Um, these, these worms live in the small intestine of the animal, and they release eggs that, again, look very, very similar to the other eggs that, that I've shown you previously. This parasite can cause diarrhea, um, anorexia and poor growth in infected animals. The next parasite that I'm going to talk about are the Imerius. Um, they, there's many different species that will affect sheep and goats. And these are not worms, they're coccidia. They are protozoal parasites. And, you know, there's many, many different species, um, but not all of them cause disease in animals. Um, Depending on the level of infection and how pathogenic the particular infection is, the animals can develop a bloody diarrhea that can be severe enough to cause death um, or poor growth. And the, the typical age that we see this in is in lambs and kids um, before and after weaning which is, you know, of course, a period of high stress for them. And also, um, it's the time that they might be first exposed to large numbers of these parasites because these um, things will persist out in the environment. Um, sheep will develop a strong and lifetime immunity, um, but goats may be less so. Um, so I, you know, it would be unusual, for example, for us to see large numbers of Imeria and um, having those Imeria actually cause disease in an adult sheep, but we definitely can see that in goats. Um, <clears throat> heavy infections that affect uh, large numbers of animals usually is something that's associated with poor hygiene and management. So there you know, are things that we can do to try to manage our way out of these problems. The Salphagostomum columbianum is also known as the nodular worm, and these worms live in the large intestine. Um, they're going to show up as firm nodules that kind of pe are peppered throughout the, the spiral colon, um, but can infect um, you know, some of the other tissues as well. And depending on the number that are present, these animals can develop a diarrhea. And, you know, again, their eggs look almost indistinguishable from the homonchus and some of the others that I've shown you previously. Strongyloides is a parasite also known as the threadworm, and the adults live in the small intestine, um, but they um, also have a, a period where they can live outside the animal. Um, Infections with strongyloides can result in diarrhea in young animals. And you know, keep in mind that this particular parasite can also be transmitted cutaneously, so through the skin or from the, from the dam um, through the milk. So the species of tapeworms that small ruminants get is um, one called the monesia. And you know, this is a kind of typical thing that uh, an infected animal might show where it's gonna be poop that has these tapeworm segments in it. And, you know, this animal clearly has diarrhea, um, but sometimes it can be perfectly normal poop with um, tapeworms on it. And the adults live in the small intestine. Um, they're generally thought to be non-pathogenic, meaning that they're not thought to cause disease. But in large numbers, um, I, I believe that they can contribute to a diarrhea situation um, or, you know, certainly even cause an obstruction um, in the animal. And this is what their eggs look like, you know, really different from the other eggs that I've shown you previously. And I'm not sure if you can see really well here, but the eggs already contain a developing larva and the sharp little spikes that you see here, um, those are the, the suckers, the little sharp suckers that they're going to use to attach to the intestines of the, the next animal that it parasitizes. Fasciola hepatica are the liver flukes that um, sheep and goats can have, and this parasite can affect cattle as well. 
uh, these liver flukes actually live in the bile ducts in the liver. So this image um, shows a very heavily infected liver. All of these, you know, like kind of disgusting white tube looking things represent bile ducts that are severely inflamed and thickened. Um, and, you know, very likely there's going to be a liver fluke living in them. Um, this picture, it's of a slightly less diseased liver, but nevertheless, there's like a disgusting looking little liver fluke living in one of those um, bile ducts. And in, in animals that have um, a pretty good infestation with this parasite, um, they'll develop liver inflammation, they can die from this disease, they can develop an anemia, weight loss, and for sure, you know, once it starts getting um, really inflamed like this, there can be little areas where the tissue will die, and that becomes a great place for some of the clostridial diseases to, to set up in. Um, and the way that we diagnose this parasite, it's a little bit different. Uh, we can't float them because the eggs are too big, they actually sink. So we need to do a fecal sedimentation exam to specifically look for them, or you know, sometimes we diagnose it on necropsy. Um, in this image, kind of showing what the life cycle looks like, you know, so there's these little flukes, they, they will lay the eggs. The eggs need to hit water in order to develop, um, and then they have to go through a snail to complete its life cycle. Um, the snail will release the kind of free swimming form of it that would end up on um, the blades of grass or the plant material that the animal will ingest to become infected. The lungworm of goats is called Mullerius capillaris, and like all the lungworms, the adults live in the lungs, um, and they will they will uh, lay eggs that end up um, hatching inside of the animal, and the larvae are what are passed out in the feces. So, in order to make the diagnosis, you know, this isn't one where we can check the poop you know, kind of screening it for the eggs. There's a certain kind of technique that we need to use called the Behrman technique, where we actually try to get the larva to swim out of the poop, and we examine the, you know, the, the sample for that. Um, or we might see them at necropsy. And what this image is kind of showing you is an infected lung, and there's all these, um, you know, bumpy areas that represent focal areas of pneumonia, and they're related to a lungworm kind of plugging up an airway and all the inflammation that kind of builds up behind that. So, you know, there's a lot of information about parasites online, but these are two of the websites that I would really recommend going to to get all the information that you need. Um, there are people who basically specialize in small ruminant parasites that have compiled a lot of information um, about ways to diagnose and ways to treat. And you'll notice that, you know, in this slide, I could have, but I didn't. I didn't talk about treatment, mostly because it's not like I want you to just go out there, read something, you know, online or watch this presentation and then just go out and buy a, a drug. We know now that there's a lot of problems with drug resistance and there are individual you know, treatment plans for every single herd that needs to evaluate the animals, the management system, etc. So it's something that you need to, you know, really work out individually, not just going off of something that you'll find on the internet. Um, and, you know, other references for this presentation I used for its veterinary parasitology for some of the images. And what I really wanted you to get out of this presentation was understanding, you know, the different parasites, how some of them are similar, how they're different, and using this reference to understand and their individual life cycle because it will give us a lot of information about how we can best target um, treating them if they are in fact the the sources of problems on on your farm and with that I will conclude this presentation thank you very much for listening and if you have any questions for me you can contact me through the uh, coordinator of this field day program thank you